I'm going to say a little bit uh, about uh, what we've been doing, uh, what we did at WIDER, and what we've been doing uh, in cooperation with the Credit Suisse Research Institute. And uh, then, because the um, topic here is uh, wealth distribution, what next, I'm going to talk about some uh, needs, need for the need for more data and the need for better data that uh, we keep uh, being reminded about as we uh, do our work in uh, looking at the world wealth distribution. And then I'm going to uh, say a few words and show a few slides about the uh, situation in China and in India, uh, which are leaders in the field of uh, uh, wealth uh, distribution statistics in the developing world. Um, okay, so um, yes, this uh, a wider project uh, produced a book. There's a copy of it on the literature table. It's pretty fat and has a gold cover with stacks of gold coins, I guess, representing wealth. And uh, it's uh, uh, very broad in terms of the topics that are covered. And I think that uh, everybody who's got a serious interest in wealth these days should have a copy of that book and it's still available on Amazon. Okay. And then uh, something else that came out was an article in the Economic Journal in March 2011, which uh, kind of summarized uh, what we had done in the uh, wider study just on the estimating the world distribution of wealth. But that was just one chapter of the OUP uh, book. Now, uh, so the last few years, uh, we've been uh, putting out an annual report and data book from Credit Suisse. The report is uh, essentially uh, targeted at a lay audience. And there's uh, a data book, which comes out each year, um, uh, which gives uh, the details about how things are done, in addition to uh, lots of numbers. Um, so anyways, um, we've uh, addressed uh, special topics in our annual reports. And here you can see what some of those are. The gender dimensions, mobility, inheritance. Uh, this year, the report is going to come out in October, probably late October, I think. Um, and the focus is on the global middle class this time. I'm going to show you, uh, not going to talk about the nuts and bolts. Uh, we did that here a, a, a year ago, and uh, I think many people have heard this before. But um, uh, what I'm going to do is show you some of the interesting results from this work. Uh, here we've got a chart of aggregate household wealth from 2000. Uh, this one uh, goes up to uh, 2013. Um, you can see that uh, basically household wealth has been rising fairly well uh, around the world, uh, except for the uh, period of the global financial crisis. And uh, not all regions have uh, uh, rebounded with equal success uh, from the financial crisis, but uh, world wealth has been growing. Um, and here's a kind of a familiar looking uh, picture uh, shows the countries in the world uh, divided up according to their uh, household wealth per adult. And uh, so the usual suspects uh, are in red high income countries, also uh, tending to be high wealth countries. You'll notice that some are white. Those are countries for which uh, we don't have any relevant data. Um, we, uh, one thing about our study is we decided at the beginning we weren't going to leave out any countries. So despite the fact they're shown here in white, uh, what we do in, the, in, in our work is we assign them the region and income group average. Um, so all countries are included. And we thought that was very important because um, uh, the countries that have less data are also the, the less wealthy countries. So if you leave them out, you get a distorted picture of what the world wealth distribution is. This is a very interesting chart that uh, Tony devised, uh, um, oh, I guess about 10 years ago, and we've been updating it. Um, along the bottom, you've got the deciles of the world wealth distribution. So you've got the poorest people on the left, the richest people on the right, and the areas show what fraction of each one of those deciles is in each one of these world regions, right? So you can see, for example, China is really big in deciles six, seven, and eight now. And if we go back 10 years ago, it was really big in deciles four, five, and six. It's moved to the right. And you can just look at the shape of that area for China and see that as, you know, if China's economic progress continues, as we all hope it will, at, uh, you know, so close to the rate that it's been going, uh, that large group of people are just you know, going to continue moving to the right. There's quite a different shape, for example, for India. It's kind of long and tapered, 
right? So there are, are some very wealthy people in India, there's a middle class in India, but the concentration of population is at uh, a lower level in world terms than the concentration of population in China. So Latin America has almost equal representation in every decile, so it's a microcosm of the world. Uh, another interesting thing is that North America has got some very poor people, very low wealth, and uh, so does Europe. Um, so uh, everybody has a, a little bit of a share uh, at each level. Uh, here, is, uh, here are the numbers that would give you a Lorenz curve for world wealth distribution last year. I'll uh, just pick out a few uh, key ones. The let's see if the laser pointer works. Uh, the share of the top 1%, we estimated last year, the share of the top 1% was 48%. Uh, in October, we'll come out with a number for 2015. Gini coefficient 0.911. Uh, it's getting pretty close to the upper limit. And this is the average wealth per adult in the world. We estimated this is all in US dollars, uh, $51,600 last year. Um, okay, last year uh, we uh, looked at the trend, uh, which was uh, new for us. We had, we had always uh, just been trying to show the most recent picture. And um, Tony in particular did quite a, a bit of work on this. And uh, what you find is that uh, in each region and for the world as a whole, maybe I'll point to the world as a whole, this uh, diagram is, this chart is for the top, share of the top 1%. From 2000 to 2007, uh, the share of the top 1% went down. You can see it actually was lower again in year 2009. Um, but then after the financial crisis, uh, it went back up. And uh, one of the main reasons for this is the, uh, that uh, world financial markets have been on a tear uh, since 2009. Uh, the stock markets have been going up and up in general with a few wobbles. Um, and uh, so, we've, so we had, uh, so if you look at any particular region, you'll see, whoops, uh, the same thing. Uh, that uh, any, Inequality, according to the uh, top 1%, was, went down to the uh, crisis and then it went up. Um, so let me move along. Uh, as I was saying, uh, we've been impressed by the, the need for more and better data in certain areas. This should not be overemphasized. Sometimes people think, oh, wealth data are not very good or they're kind of sparse or so on. Um, Two-thirds, the countries that have wealth data represent about two-thirds of the world's population. They have 95% of the world's wealth. And uh, so we shouldn't, shouldn't and uh, the quality and the quantity of wealth data keeps increasing all the time. I mean, for example, the ECB uh, sponsored uh, the development of wealth surveys in 15 countries on a standardized basis. This came out a year or two ago. A uh, great leap forward for Europe. We have wealth surveys in China and India. We've had them for some time. Um, you know, so uh, it's the picture is not that you know some desperate problem with wealth data. Uh, that uh, I, okay. So, anyways, uh, having said that, um, there are two kinds of data that we use. One are household balance sheets. These are part of the. Uh, UN system of national accounts. There are supposed to be balance sheets for every sector. And the high income countries have these. Uh, in the South, uh, South Africa uh, has got household balance sheets, but in general, they're currently lacking for developing countries. So we need more of those. Uh, that gives us the level of wealth. Uh, of course, what we do for the missing countries is we do imputations. They're based on a regression approach. And I won't go into the details on that. Um, so in total, there were 47 countries that had uh, this kind of data, although uh, for 30 of them, they only had it for the financial assets and debts, not for the real assets. Uh, micro statistics. Uh, at the moment, there are 28 countries that currently have uh, wealth survey data. Um, there will be others very soon. Ireland and Uruguay, within the next year, will be releasing uh, their numbers. And uh, we heard yesterday at a conference in uh, uh, Berlin that uh, Poland is also working on uh, getting their wealth uh, survey data out. So um, there are more of these countries all the time. 
uh, but very few uh, developing countries. Uh, fortunately, the two largest developing countries have this data. There was a uh, there is a data set from Indonesia for Indonesia, but it's from 1998, so it's getting a little bit old at this point. Thailand uh, has uh, has a survey uh, in South America, Chile. Um, so, you know, there there is some regional representation, but uh, there's a need for uh, for more of this uh, data to be collected, and there's no reason not to do it. Uh, okay, the next question I'm going to ask is. Um, about uh, pensions, and uh, this is very relevant for high-income countries, but I think is increasingly relevant in developing countries. Uh, for example, uh, there's a very complex and interesting pension situation in China. I don't know a lot about it, but I'm reading a little bit about it. And this is an important form of wealth for uh, many uh, middle-class, upper-middle-class families uh, in that country, and probably is as well in uh, quite a few other developing countries. Um, the countries. So at the moment, uh, for some reason, English-speaking countries uh, have uh, moved into this in a, a big way. So Australia, Canada, and the UK, they have the employer-based estimates of employer-based pensions. You know, the present value of your benefits that you're going to get uh, when you retire, that's included in the wealth surveys. The US uh, only has the defined contribution pensions, but that's you know about half of what's going on in the US at the moment, defined benefit or left out. Uh, and then there are a lot of countries that include uh, what are sometimes called private pension plans, uh, tax-sheltered uh, household savings. Um, the impact of including employer-based pensions uh, differs uh, depending on the country. Um, Australia in the top line here, we can see that the share of the, don't have the numbers for the share of the top 10%, share of the top 20% hardly changes if you put this in. On the other hand, in Canada, share of the top 20% goes down by five percentage points. And uh, Gini coefficients, according to the US, uh, the UK estate tax uh, data, which was very good in 1994, uh, in putting in employer based pensions would reduce the Gini coefficient from 0.67 to 0.59. So, this is something that really has to be thought about seriously in the design of uh, uh, wealth surveys um, going forward. Uh, need for better data. Um, I would say that uh, more attention needs to be paid to the upper tail of the uh, wealth distribution. And this is not controversial. The people who produce the data are well aware of the problems. There's both sampling error and non-sampling error. Um, the sampling error can be illustrated by figuring out what's the chances of getting some of these genuinely rich people in your sample. So if uh, I forgot to put down the sample size for these calculations, but in a sample of um, 10,000 uh, households, say, your chances of getting something in the top 0.01% by random sampling are only 63%. Uh, the chances of getting at least one billionaire in India in a sample of size 10,000 uh, is only 0.1%. Uh, and in fact, it'd be kind of embarrassing if you did find a billionaire, it might throw all the calculations off. Um, but the non-sampling error is a much worse problem. Basically, once people are you know, past a certain point, they're not going to answer your sample survey, right? There are going to be non-respondents. So there's a big problem of differential non-response, and there's under-reporting, under there are validation studies, studies that show that this is especially important for financial assets. So it's something to be aware of. Now, in our uh, global wealth work, uh, we try to do something about that. In this slide, I list some other sources of data that can be brought in. What we bring in are the Forbes and other rich lists. Um, and I've said here, this is exhortation, don't randomly sample to determine the upper tail of the distribution of stars according to their brightness. Go outside and look. <laughs> uh, if, you're gonna, if you're gonna try to establish the distribution of stars according to their brightness, of course you would go and you would just look up in the sky, you could see the brightest stars and make a list. Well, that's what Forbes and these other organizations, Sunday Times in the UK are doing. Right, we all know, you know, Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, you know, the, Carlos Slim, Mittal, and so on. These are household names. So we shouldn't pretend we don't know that these are the richest people in the world. And we have estimates that have been provided by journalists. And uh, these uh, people themselves can object if they think those numbers are wrong. And by and large, they haven't done that. So let's, now here is a kind of a simplified uh, um, explanation of uh, what we do to correct the upper tail of the distribution. We do this for, uh, uh, all the countries that have uh, Forbes billionaires. Uh, the blue line, uh, so we've got the log of wealth on the horizontal axis, the log of the number of people who have uh, wealth above 
the given level on the vertical axis. If you have a Pareto distribution, this would uh, show us a straight line. So the actual distributions from survey evidence are not a straight line in the upper tail. They tend to droop. The blue line is representative. I think it was from China. Um, and so what we do is uh, the number of billionaires, billion dollars is this, uh, you know, 1E plus 09. That's a billion. Um, so for each uh, country, we can say, well, how many billionaires were there? That gives us one point on this line. The other point is found by taking a straight line which asymptotes to the blue line that comes from the survey. Okay, so uh, Tony Schrox has uh, done quite a bit of work and uh, has done refinements. This is the basic approach uh, that we use. Um, here just for fun is a list of the billionaires. 535 of them this year in uh, the US. You can see that in India, which is number 21, it was four at the beginning of our project, 2001. It's now 92. Uh, some other countries uh, have not had very much uh, increase. Russia has had a bit ex big explosion, which happened quite early, actually, in this period. Uh, China is number 39. Uh, according to Forbes, had 213 billionaires uh, this year, and back in 2001, it had just one. So things are uh, pretty dynamic, and there are lots of countries that had none in 2001, and now they have some. Um, here's a comparison of the top tail from the survey data and then after it's been uh, revised in our estimation. So for some of these countries, um, there's a big difference. Uh, Chile is a good example. Uh, according to their survey, the share of the top 10% was 30, about 38%. According to us, it's 69%. So uh, it's just that if you, you go out and sample you know, 4,000, 5,000 households, collecting them in the usual way, your stratified clustered ra random sample, you're, you're not getting a reflection of the true upper tail. Uh, now, countries that have registered data like Denmark and Norway and Sweden, of course, uh, they get much closer to what we think is uh, a good estimate of the concentration. So there we have 69% of their survey, 68% in our stuff. Um, the country that has really excellent uh, well survey and shows that you can actually, these surveys can be uh, uh, very good is the US. Their survey of consumer finance, which is conducted by the Federal Reserve Board, uh, they've invested a lot in this oversampling of the upper tail, which is a standard approach in surveys to try and deal with these problems. Uh, they have a what they call a list sample of people, and what they do is they have income tax records on the high-income people, and taking that and other stuff into account, they try to guess what their wealth is, and then they pick a high, high wealth, predicted high wealth sample of people, and they oversample them about uh, in the highest wealth category, only 15% of those people will respond to the uh, survey. They actually leave out what's referred to as the Forbes 400 from their sampling frame. They just say, well, there's no point, you know. The, <laughs> Forbes is telling us what their wealth is, and they're probably not going to respond to our survey, so they're not even in the sampling frame. So they don't deal with those top 400 families. At any rate, you can see 74% in the survey, 74.6% in our estimates. Um, China and India. Okay, well, uh, when... Um, we first started thinking about, could we estimate the world distribution of wealth? Uh, we didn't realize this. Uh, we looked into it and discovered that there was uh, very good surveys in both China and India, and then we knew we were in business, because there you have about a third of the world's population. Um, so under uh, the umbrella of the uh, Chinese Academy of Social Sciences, a group of researchers in the Institute of Economics, of whom uh, Li Shi, who's here today, is uh, uh, one of the leaders, um, have conducted a series of wealth surveys. Uh, the ones where the results have already been published are for 1995 and 2002. 1995, the wealth genie was 0.45. 2002, it was 0.55. Um, the 2013, res uh, I'm sorry, actually, this number should say 2013, I believe, right? Those uh, results have not yet been released, but uh, uh, Li Shi was uh, telling me that um, uh, according to their uh, preliminary work with the data, they think the Gini coefficient is going to be approxim approximately 0.65. So the wealth inequality, of course, has in continued to increase in uh, China. There's another survey um, conducted at Chengdu University um, uh, 2012, and, and they actually have a two, two, 
2013 version as well, seems to concentrate on higher income people, and it may actually be that, relatively speaking, the financial assets are overestimated in that, in that survey. Uh, I want to know more about it. Uh, we would like to know more about this survey before we uh, make use of it in our uh, work with uh, uh, Credit Suisse and don't have enough confidence in that at the moment. Um, India, well, there's, uh, this is the distributional data from 1995 to 2002 for China. Uh, one of the big things that happened is that the urban per capita wealth shot up, while the rural per capita wealth uh, did not increase very much at all. Um, India uh, has had a, a wealth survey conducted every 10 years with a, actually a very large sample. Earlier I was talking about what would happen if they had a sample of 10,000 households uh, in India. Actually, the number is more like 130,000, and the response rate is re reported response rate is very high. It's about 95%. Um, and uh, so you've got a relatively small increase in inequality. Well, actually, looks about the same in those first two years. But the 2012 data, which is just out, the Gini coefficient leaps up to 0.716, and this is without any adjustment for the upper tail. So my conclusions are, uh, first of all, that uh, world wealth inequality is high. It fell before the financial crisis and increased after. Uh, we need uh, more data. Uh, household balance sheets and wealth surveys need to spread to more countries. Uh, there are examples to follow. The, the South Africa is uh, um, taking the lead there on the household balance sheets, and China and India have taken the lead on the uh, wealth surveys. And there are some issues that uh, need to be considered carefully, pensions, and uh, what to do about the upper tail. Thanks.